Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And today I want to talk briefly about the new Zeiss Battis 40mm f2.0. But before I do, just a reminder from our friendly neighborhood Department of Commerce that official Three Blind Men and an Elephant swag t-shirts are now available at our online store at 3bmep.threadless.com. If you like what you see here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, and click on that little alarm bell to keep up to date. And please consider supporting our work by using our affiliate links down below or even contribute directly via PayPal or joining us on Patreon. Links in the show notes down below as well. So thank you. Now, this is one of those times when I can be blissfully brief because there's really very little to say other than this. In spite of its rather off-kilter focal length, it had simply never occurred to me that I might want this particular field of view, the Battis 40mm f2.1 displays all of the signature strengths of the Battis line, from tremendous image and build quality to fast, silent, internal autofocusing, making it perfect for stills and especially video, lightweight, and novel industrial design, including that on-lens OLED display for depth of field, though it only shows when in manual focus mode. Two adds a three-position focus range switch, which works well, though my personal inclination would be to use DMF, manual override, except when I know I'm shooting exclusively close in. And three, with that 40 millimeter field of view, and its minimum focusing distance of nine and a half inches suddenly becomes a stellar split the baby kind of street and travel photography option offering a 0.3x or 1 to 3.3 magnification at maximum. Especially if you like capturing details and isolating them with shallow depth of field because this autofocusing f2 full frame lens allows a shallowness that would require an f1.0 autofocusing lens on a micro four thirds camera and an f1.2 or 1.3 autofocusing lens on an APS-C camera. As far as I know, there are none of the former and only a couple of the latter, but not really quite at this field of view. Now, at $1,300 a pop, the Battis 40 f2 isn't cheap, but at just 361 grams, it compares favorably to Sigma's 50mm f1.4 art lens, which, though significantly less expensive at 950, weighs in at a whopping 815 grams yet offers just half the maximum magnification. The Battis also compares favorably to Sony's 50mm 1.4 Planar T-Star, which also tips the scales at more than double the Zeiss's weight at 778 grams, also yielding only half the maximum magnification, and comes in at an even stiffer 1500 bucks. The Battis also compares well against one of my favorite lenses, Sony's 35mm f1.4 Distagon. The Distagon is even dearer at $1,600, so at that price, you still only get half the maximum magnification of the Zeiss, and while less portly than the other two, still tips the scales at a hefty, relatively speaking, 630 grams. This is the first Zeiss lens I'd call a relative bargain. Thanks to the good folks at Adorama, guys, thank you, I was able to mount it to a Sony A7 R3 and then bring it up onto the High Line during our worldwide photo walk this past weekend. Both Claudia and I were more interested in the wonderful group of people who joined us than in taking photographs, per se, but in between the joy of sharing passions with other enthusiasts, I did manage to shoot enough to affirm that this is a dream combo. want those extra megapixels so that you can punch in when you want to back away from your subject to lessen the greater distortion you get at 40 than you do at 50. Interesting, right? Using megapixels and distance to allow you the lightweight and single lens mindset this particular piece of glass inspires. Hold that thought. Yes, there is a difference between 1.4 and 2.0 that I can see and might occasionally wish for, 
But it's a trade-off I'd be happy to make in exchange for the 40F2's day-long carryability. Yes, I wish the lens had a manual clutch so that you could pull back on the focusing ring to engage hard stops at minimum focusing distance and infinity. In fact, the even wider integrated Leica Sumalux 28mm f1.7 on the Leica CL. Do I have that around here anyway? Yeah. Yeah. Here. With its macro focusing capability is, for me, the benchmark in manual focusing autofocus lenses. It's an interesting comparison, don't you think? Going wide, going macro, going expensive. 4500 for the CL, 4300 for the a7R3 with Battis 40mm f2, or 3300 if you swap in the a7 III. Of course, it's different if you already have the body. Now, these are quite different with the interchangeable lens Sony Battis combos offering far superior hybrid performance, including brilliant 4K recording, and with the R3 and eh, actually R2's 42 megapixel sensor, the ability to give you options the 24 megapixel CL just cannot. Never mind the ability to swap out lenses. Yes, I did have to futz with the AF settings on the A7R3, even when I narrowed the focus range on the Battis, to get optimal autofocus performance. Settling on center focus point with autofocus drive speed set to normal and autofocus tracking sensitivity set to responsive for my quickie informal video test. It really is a killer combo with all the benefits of full frame low light performance, the assuredness of third generation hybrid autofocus, and the shallow depth of field, as I said earlier, hard to replicate in crop sensor cameras using autofocus lenses. Still, with this said, the hard reality is that the image quality gap between the best lenses and very, very good lenses has been closing for several years now, as has the continuous autofocus gap in movie mode. Our Panasonic GH5, for example, with the Leica DG Vario Elmerit 12 to 62.8 to 4 and 15mm f1.7 did quite well, if occasionally exhibiting slight telltale contrast detect only autofocus flutter. The Fuji X-T3, once I futzed with its settings sufficiently and swapped out the 18-55 kit lens for the 16-55 2.8, did very well too, though I saw room for improvement in its autofocus smoothness and consistency, a firmware kind of thing. And the Leica CL, which is most assuredly not a video-oriented camera with its 1080-60p max, no headphone jack, no mic jack, did surprisingly well too. Though, among other things, the CL is not exactly a wildlife or sports shooter's cameras. Hold that thought for another review another time. All of which is a long way of saying. The Battis 40mm f2 is a great lens for a great camera. But it is not the only game in town. If you haven't spent time with a GH5 in the Leica 12-60, or say a G9 with that 550 bucks, 115 gram Leica 15mm f1.7 for stills, yeah, stills, you might be quite surprised by what these $2,500 and $2,100 micro four thirds packages can offer. If you haven't tried the $2,500 APS-C Fuji X-T3 package I just mentioned, you might be quite surprised by what it offers. And all three of those combinations offer things no Sony A7 variant can in video, including internal 4K recording up to 60p, the GH5 and X-T3 up to 10-bit internal. Though, none of these crop sensor combos will give you as shallow a depth of field, I think I'm saying this the third time now, with autofocus lenses, nor, to be fair, as consistent continuous autofocus performance and ultimate low-light capability. Or dynamic range, for that matter. Which, in the end, matters greatly. Or not a whit, depending on what you want to do and with which manual of arms you feel most comfortable. Let me sum it up this way. If you do street or travel photography, you want to carry light, and you already have an A7 plane R or S, 1, 2, or 3, the baddest 40mm F2 is almost a no-brainer. If the 42 has caught your eye and you also happen to be thinking of upgrading from an earlier 7 to the A7R3 for its better ergos, AF, battery life, IBIS, EVF, or an A9, buying lens and camera, both, is almost a no-brainer. The 42 is, in fact, to me, a compelling reason to buy the A7R3, and the A7R3 a compelling reason to buy the 40mm F2. 
It's this kind of combination that will continue to give Sony the edge, in my estimation, over Canon's and Nikon's new full-frame mirrorless systems until their lens lines and sensors are as fully fleshed out. On the other hand, if you are not a Sony shooter or you are not wedded to full frame, well, yeah, there are other amazing, far less expensive, smaller, lighter choices that will get you so close to what you want that I'd wager it's you rather than the gear that will more often than not likely be the gating factor. I know whereof I speak. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. You guys continue to be just incredible, knowledgeable, inspiring, funny. I mean, you're a joy, truly. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Grab one or both of our new Hold That Thought t-shirts you wanted us to put up at our new 3bmepthreadless.com store. Support our work by using our affiliate links down below in the show notes, dropping us coffee money via our PayPal link down below in the show notes, or even better than that, we invite you to become a patron of our work over at Patreon. Link down below. We've created our Patreon page because we are stoked to bring you not only gear reviews, but with our What Were You Thinking and Good World Gone Bad series, historical, educational, artistic morsels, and longer form conversations, not interviews, with world-class photographers, curators, gallery owners, keepers of the legacy, folks like Elliot Erwitt, Anya Sear, Mark Lubell, Ethelene Staley, and friends like Brian Smith, Paul Giroux, Nino Rakicevich, and more. We'd really like you to join us to deliver this kind of content regularly. Your support on Patreon will really help us ramp it up. In which case, as always, we thank you for it. That's it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.